Okay, uh, hello everyone uh, and welcome to the second webinar in a series of uh, our online seminars hosted by the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and International Crime. Um, my name is Ole Martin Stormoon. Uh, I'm a junior research fellow here at New and for those of you who are not familiar with the consortium, uh, it has existed since 2002 and consists of uh, the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, the Norwegian Defence Research Establishment, uh, um, more commonly known as the FFE, uh, the Police University College, and the Centre for Research on Extremism, uh, the CIREX at the University of Oslo. Uh, Dr. Rita Augusta Knudsen is the, a senior research fellow here at NUPI as the consortium's uh, managing director with uh, Professor Tore Bjørgo from CIREX as the academic director. Um, before we start, uh, I would just like to, to give some, some practical information. Um, as most of our normal uh, seminars, this event will also be recorded and, uh, and if we don't have any technical issues during the next hour or so, it will also be uploaded to Newbie's YouTube channel. Um, our plan for the coming hour is um, as follows. Um, after this introduction, uh, we will have uh, Evian's uh, presentation. Uh, and after the presentation, we'll uh, gather the questions uh, you uh, post in our Q&A um, function uh, which is probably on the top right hand corner of your screens. Uh, you can post your questions uh, during the talk and whenever you, you uh, feel like. Uh, and also if, if for those of you uh, do, that don't post any questions, if you see any questions that you like, you feel free to press like and uh, those the, the, the questions with, with the most likes are, are going to be at the top of a list. So uh, over to today's uh, topic. Um, this seminar uh, it starts with the question, uh, which is pretty simple. How global is the far right? Um, uh, Evian's talk will, will showcase how, uh, how we're increasingly seeing the far right as a global phenomenon. Uh, this is evident by the recent terrorist attacks inspired by uh, like-minded perpetrators across the world, but also uh, the parties leader at, at the far right leaders at the, at the international level. Um, what is less um, known, however, is, is the extent uh, of, of the global phenomenon uh, beyond the Western countries. So uh, in her presentation, uh, Evian will, will discuss uh, both the historical emergence and the contemporary manifestations of, of the far right in India and focusing on the transnational connections between the far right actors and organizations in India and their counterparts in, in the West. Um, uh, in short, she will help us understand how, how the, the far right operates and, and ultimately succeeds in countries beyond the West and providing insights from, from India, which uh, is her case study. Uh, Evian uh, Leidig is, is a postdoctoral fellow at the MF Norwegian School of Theology uh, and is uh, working on the Research Council of Norway, uh, funded by uh, uh, sorry the the Intersect project funded by the Research Council of Norway, uh, in co collaboration with the Center for Research on Extremism uh, at the University of Oslo. She was recently awarded her PhD from CIREX, um, in, in which she traced the the, the transnational connections uh, of the far right between India and the West, uh, and particularly through the the role of the Indian di di diaspora networks. She's also the head of publishing at the Center for Analysis of Radical of the Radical Right and an associate fellow at the Global Network on Extremism and Technology, the GNET, based at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization. So uh, with those uh, th that brief introduction, I will uh, pass the word to Avian and let her go on with her presentation. Okay. So I just want to say uh, thank you for uh, that very kind introduction. And I would also like to thank the consortium at NUPI for giving me the opportunity to present on an area of research that I have been working on for the past three years in my PhD, and now I'm building upon in my postdoc. Uh, 
And I would especially like to thank Rita for convening and inviting me to present my research and to Ole for his hard work on the technical aspect of organizing this webinar. So thank you very much. So uh, in this presentation today, um, understanding the global far right lessons from India, I really want to narrow in on two key points for takeaway. The first is that I want to explore India as a case study of a successful far right movement within the global south. But more than that, I secondly want to use India as a springboard for exploring global dynamics of the far right. So in short, I want to challenge us in thinking about how the far right operates and ultimately succeeds beyond the West. And we tend to label such phenomena as ethnic violence or perhaps right wing authoritarianism in the global south when we should really be considering these movements as part of a universal far right framework. So to start off, I want to discuss. Pardon me. What I see as the unreported terrorist attack. In February this year, a 17 year old shooter attacked an Islamic university in New Delhi. That photo that you see there on the right is a photo that the shooter posted on Facebook shortly before carrying out the attack. The shooter broadcast the attack live on Facebook, as we have seen with other similar far right terrorist attacks. And importantly, footage from the viral video that went live on Facebook showed about 20 police officers that stood by watching the attack unfold despite pleas from victims um, from the perpetrator shootings. It was later revealed that the shooter had been radicalized online, particularly on Facebook and WhatsApp channels by Hindu nationalist activists and importantly politicians. What I want to illustrate with this example is the lack of international media coverage regarding this attack, which stands out starkly in comparison to similar attacks that are perpetrated in Western countries. And this double standard when it comes towards covering and understanding far right phenomena beyond the West. But in order to understand the motivations of this shooter, it's important to understand what is Hindu nationalism, which forms the far right framework in India. Now, Hindu nationalism broadly refers to a political project of achieving a Hindu rastra or state in India. The founder of Hindu nationalism wrote in 1923, we Hindus are bound together not only by the tie of love we bear to a common fatherland and by the common blood that courses through our veins and keeps our hearts throbbing and our affections warm, but also by the tie of the common homage we pay to our great civilization, our Hindu culture. This rhetoric isn't far off from other extreme right uh, movements that we see in Western countries. And indeed, the early founders of Hindu nationalism were greatly inspired by uh, their European counterparts in developing this ideology. And I want to make explicit that Hindu nationalism is by all means a far right ideology and movement when it's commonly misunderstood as a form of religious extremism. And by far right, I'm referring specifically to nativism, extreme nationalism and authoritarianism. In short, Hindu nationalism needs to be viewed as a variant of the far right. So how did Hindu nationalism emerge in India? It first rose as an anti-colonial resistance movement under the British Raj. In this instance, the British were viewed as an external enemy, whilst Muslims were viewed as an internal enemy who were complicit in the colonial project. I think what makes Hindu nationalism unique as a far right movement is that since its very origins, Hindu nationalism has been part of a global far right dynamic. 
1925, there was the founding of the RSS, which is a paramilitary organization and the first Hindu nationalist organization. So that photo that you see there on the bottom right is the photo of the RSS. And the founder of the RSS was greatly inspired by fascist Italy and indeed traveled to meet Mussolini and watched the black shirts in action. And this later became an inspiration for the modus operandi of the RSS who engage in physical drill exercises and believe that a healthy body equates to a healthy nation. So there's a very distinct masculine aspiration within the uh, hierarchical structure of the RSS. And RSS members are also uh, taught selective ancient Hindu texts that glorify the Hindu Rastra or the Hindu state. Indeed, these connections continued with the rise of Nazi Germany in the 1930s. And in particular, Nazi Germany became a model in its treatment of the so-called Jewish problem as an inspiration for India's, quote, Muslim problem. And this turn towards militancy and racial superiority became a sort of distinct uh, motivating framework for the RSS during this time. Similarly, during the 1930s, we saw interactions which consisted of correspondences between intellectuals uh, in newspapers and letters, the establishment of institutions and student exchanges as well between Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and uh, Hindu nationalist organizations within India. And even during this time, we saw covert intelligence operations uh, during the Second World War. So in short, I want to emphasize that for Hindu nationalists, being a Hindu equates to blood and soil, where religion is viewed as secondary to race. And this has been consistently articulated by Hindu nationalist ideologues. Following India's independence and the Second World War uh, in 1947, Hindu nationalism grew into a network of organizations called the Samparivar or the family of organizations. This includes political parties such as the BJP or the Indian People's Party, uh, as well as youth wings. So what you see with the photo on the top right is the Badrandal, which is essentially a male-led extreme right um, militant organization that's a youth wing. Uh, there is also the formation of cultural organizations, trade and farmer unions, and even female-only groups. So that photo that you see there on the bottom right is essentially the female equivalent of the RSS, where young women are engaged in combat training and shooting training. In 1948, uh, an RSS member assassinated Mahatma Gandhi due to Gandhi's secularism and supposed appeasement of Muslims in allowing for the creation of Pakistan with the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947. Shortly after this incident, the RSS was proscribed as an organization by the government and was once again proscribed in the 1970s, but it has since been reinstated as an organization and indeed today remains one of the most powerful Hindu nationalist organizations operating within India. Throughout the latter part of the 20th century, Hindu nationalism has remained somewhat on the fringe. And I say somewhat because it's always had a constant presence within the public sphere, but it hasn't had significant electoral success except at the local and the state level. But that changed in 2014. In 2014, the BJP candidate which is a, a Hindu nationalist political party, uh, the BJP candidate Narendra Modi was elected as Prime Minister of India. Now, Modi has a reputation um, for having joined the RSS at the age of nine and quickly rose through its ranks and similarly did so uh, through the BJP. He became the chief minister of the western state of Gujarat and during this time period uh, his 
administration was documented to have been complicit in riots organized by Hindu nationalist organizations with the police, which led Modi to be called the architect of the 2002 riots, which saw some of the worst communal violence between Hindus and Muslims in India's history. Following the Gujarat riots, Modi was banned from visiting the UK, US and other European countries. That is until he was elected as prime minister in 2014. During the 2014 campaign, Modi was called uh, by the New York Times the social media politician. Indeed, his dark past was now reconfigured as one of a charismatic populist figure who represents upward social mobility and is outspoken of India becoming a techno-economic powerhouse in the 21st century, which broadly appeals to India's urban middle-class youth. And indeed, when we think about Modi as a figure, what's often more frequently portrayed is that photo that you see there on the bottom right as a figure who speaks at Facebook's headquarters in Silicon Valley rather than his reputation previously as the architect of the 2002 riots. In 2019, last year, Modi and the BJP was re-elected with an even greater majority this time. Undoubtedly, under Modi, Hindu nationalism has become a mainstream phenomenon. And I want to illustrate this by discussing four key incidences. The first is that there has been a rise in vigilantism within India, particularly cow vigilantism. Now, this is when uh, young Hindu men um, coalesce in mobs and attack Muslim laborers because of their involvement in cow production and the industry. And this is because the cow is viewed as sacred within Hinduism. Since 2014, Amnesty International has recorded a spike in the number of cow vigilante attacks within India. And cow vigilante groups are not always affiliated with former Hindu nationalist organizations, but see it as um, an encouragement by organizations like the RSS to conduct and carry out their attacks, and they feel emboldened under the climate of Hindu nationalism within Modi's India. The second incident, which shows how Hindu nationalism has become mainstream, was last summer the revocation of Article 370 in the region of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, Article 370 refers to the special semi-autonomous status of the region of Jammu and Kashmir, which was granted during the partition of India and Pakistan. And it has led since 1947 for the region to be divided between India administered, Pakistan administered, and a small bit of China administered Jammu and Kashmir. Now, last summer, the BJP government decided to revoke the special semi autonomous status of Jammu and Kashmir, citing the potential of terrorist plots within the region. For many analysts, they see the BJP's actions in this revocation in order to advance the Hindu nationalist agenda of creating what's called an undivided India. So this is an Arendtis project of achieving a Hindu Rastra in which the surrounding territories of Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, and some parts of Afghanistan and Myanmar are once again reunited under the Hindu Rastra or the Hindu state. So this foreign policy move was seen as advancing that undivided India project. The third incident which shows how Hindu nationalism has become mainstream under Modi's India was the introduction and passage of the controversial Citizenship Amendment Act last December. What this act essentially allows is for the fast track citizenship of what the BJP determines to be religiously persecuted minorities in surrounding uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Now, the reason why this bill was so controversial is because Islam was not included as a religious category of persecution, despite the fact that there are 
certain Islamic sects within Bangladesh and Pakistan that are persecuted. And what gave sparks to outrage in the passage of this bill is that it essentially violates the country's founding constitutional principles of secularism and respect for religious diversity, thus instigating large protests across the country as well as across the world in acts of solidarity. Snowballing from the Citizenship Amendment Act was the most recent riots in Delhi in February. Now, the Delhi riots began with incitements of violence from a BJP politician who essentially encouraged young Hindu men to congregate in mobs and attack the CAA protesters predominantly within Muslim neighborhoods, um, inciting and describing uh, such protesters as anti-national. The consequence of these riots is this has been the worst levels of violence witnessed within the capital's history in decades. Another key aspect of understanding the rise of Hindu nationalism in Modi's India is understanding as well the rise of internet Hindus. So the rise of internet Hindus or cyber Hindus uh, within India and the diaspora is essentially a vast army of keyboard warriors who are recruited by the BJP to use mainstream social media sites to push pro-Modi, pro-Hindu nationalist content, as well as anti-Muslim and in particular anti-Pakistan content. If you look at the infographic on the slide, it denotes five shades of saffron. So saffron is the color that is used by the um, by Hindu nationalists because of its association with the color of saffron in, in Hinduism. An infographic details how to spot an internet Hindu, designating five different types of internet Hindus. The first type is that, or if you can see my cursor, is that of the angry saffronists. So these are essentially the conspiracy theorists who are anti-Islam and anti-Christian. They're perhaps what we might see as the more extreme conspiracy, conspiratorial elements of the extreme right. The second type of internet Hindu one can find are the so-called Modi fanboys. So these are not necessarily BJP supporters or even RSS supporters, but those who support Modi and uh, his governance. The third type of internet Hindu one can find are the so-called San old boys. So these are those who meticulously tow the RSS doctrine and they perhaps don't see Modi or the BJP as pushing the Hindu nationalist agenda far enough. And the fourth type of internet Hindu one can find are the so-called BJP loyalists. So these are the hardcore BJP party supporters who may not necessarily be RSS supporters, but support the political party. And then lastly, the fifth type of internet Hindu one can find online are the right brainers. So these are perhaps those not so concerned with Hindu nationalist ideology or its movement, but those who essentially support right wing economic policies, which Modi represents in pushing India towards this techno economic powerhouse and development. What this infographic shows is that like all far right movements, internet Hindus is or Hindu nationalism is fragmented and composed of various factions, some with competing and contradictory motivations. But unlike all far right movements, internet Hindus are orchestrated by a vast political party apparatus, namely that of the BJP. Indeed, the BJP has developed slick professionalized operations with even its communications director having been educated in the US. And many people may not know this, but the BJP has outsourced many of its IT activities to the diaspora with an epicenter of activity in North America. Recently, however, we have seen the use of alternative media like the image board website 4chan and encrypted messaging channels like WhatsApp, Telegram, and Discord. And indeed, India is WhatsApp's largest market in the world, and it's a particularly um, 
useful tool of communication, but on the other hand, such communication can stem towards plotting violent plots, especially with the aforementioned uh, cow vigilante groups, and it was instrumental in organizing mobs during the most recent riots in Delhi in February. One problem that I will note with the use of technologies like WhatsApp in India is that the security measures that have been developed on WhatsApp in order to spread or prevent the spread of disinformation and misinformation is that the security measures uh, like limits on 40 messages, for example, uh, isn't effective in countries like India, which have outdated mobiles and don't support software updates of uh, WhatsApp's technology. Combined with this, India's population of mass mobile users, along with low media literacy rates, creates a toxic combination. So now that I've given an overview of Hindu nationalism within India, describing its historical emergence and its manifestations today, I want to turn now towards the global dynamics of how Hindu nationalism is connected to far-right movements around the world. We have seen, for instance, the far-right create alliances internationally, a launch shared anti-Muslim narratives. So I've given a couple examples there. On the top left, we see a tweet from the British far right and uh, anti Sharia activist Amory Waters, who tweets, if the recent million or so migrants to Europe had been Hindu, say, would the terror slash rape still have followed? We all know the answer. So this is a tweet in response to the effects of the 2015 refugee crisis, which saw a disproportionate number of male, uh, pardon, of Muslim migrants um, escaping the Syrian civil war to Europe. What I find most interesting about this tweet is how Amory Waters compares Hindus to Muslims and essentially stereotypes Muslims as intolerant, as violent and as aggressive versus Hindus who, by comparison, are viewed as tolerant, as peaceful and as non-aggressive. And indeed, this is the same rhetoric that is used by Hindu nationalists within India. And one might ask, how does Amory Waters come to this comparison? And importantly, Amory Waters founded an extreme right political party called For Britain, who incidentally, the grassroots mobilization is led by a British Hindu activist. And there on the top right is a tweet from the British counter jihad and uh, founder and former leader of the English Defence League, Tommy Robinson, who posts um, on Twitter uh, an article from a Hindu nationalist website that's based in India. And Tommy Robertson is a very interesting figure in terms of uh, having brought to um, the UK um, Hindu nationalist narratives and sort of um, having been an outwardly spoken figure on this particular issue. And indeed, when Tommy Robinson, who has spoken about so-called Muslim grooming gangs in the UK, has similarly discussed how Hindu girls are also targets of these Muslim grooming gangs. And indeed, he has interviewed extreme Hindu nationalists uh, about the threat of Islam. And one could only find this example of an interview on the Canadian alternative far-right media outlet, Rebel News. And finally, there in the middle, we see a tweet from the Dutch far-right politician, Kurt Wilders, who tweets, proud to stand with the great ally, Shalib Shali Kumar, chairman, Republican Hindu coalition. Now, Shali Kumar is the founder of an Indian American advocacy group, which promotes favorable US-India relations. And this tweet, um, or this photo rather, that was posted on Twitter was taken even before um, the 2016 US election. So it's quite telling to see figures like Gert Wilders standing next to 
uh, Indian American individuals in order to promote what they see as a nationalist cooperative agenda. Indeed, the Hindu diaspora, uh, as well as Western far right actors, essentially serve as political entrepreneurs for bridging together these disparate movements of the far right and creating transnational ties. A further example of how these connections are being formed is one used to only look at alt-right connections in Sweden and in the US. So there on the left, you see a photo from a newspaper in Sweden, which shows Daniel Freiberg. So he is the co-founder of altright.com with the figure with the white supremacist Richard Spencer and also co-founder of Arctos Media, which is a white nationalist publishing company. Incidentally, Arctos Media was originally founded in India and publishes Hindu nationalist authors alongside European white nationalist authors. And uh, Daniel Freiberg has uh, been creating connections with Hindu nationalists in India. And there on the right, you see a tweet from the Indian ambassador to the US, who is meeting there with uh, Steve Bannon, the uh, alt-right figure who um, founded Breitbart. And in 2015, Breitbart actually tried to set up a Breitbart India, but it ultimately failed to due to logistical reasons. But Bright, but Steve Bannon has been a longtime adm admirer of Modi uh, and of, of Hindu nationalism. Indeed, he is involved in a quite esoteric element of um, intellectual exchanges between Hindu nationalism and extreme far right um, movements within Europe. However, these connections are also evident and legitimized through state diplomatic efforts through elected representatives. So what you see there in that photo uh, is, quote, an unofficial visit of mostly far right members of the European Parliament who visited Modi in Delhi and Kashmir while it was under lockdown last October. And the reason why this trip was so controversial was that Kashmir was not even open to Indian MPs, journalists, or even foreign journalists and UN peacekeeping operations. But it was, for some reason, open to these members of the European Parliament. The purpose of the trip was supposedly to see, according to these MEPs, how things really are on the ground in Jammu and Kashmir instead of supposed biased uh, media coverage of, of the region. And the stance is that, you know, Pakistani sponsored terrorist plots gave the reason for India to take an authoritative stance in the region. Hence that quote that you see there in the title, we stand by India in its fight against terrorism, as stated by the French MEP Terry Mariani who essentially argued that incidences within Kashmir is an internal matter uh, within India's jurisdiction. Importantly, this trip of MEPs was organized by Indian diaspora lobbyists in Europe, specifically in Brussels. So once again, this is an example of how political entrepreneurs are seizing opportunities to create transnational ties along shared nationalist agendas. So what was the consequence of this trip? Well, a few months later, these MEPs called for a bill to be withdrawn from the European Parliament, which condemns India's actions on the aforementioned Citizenship Amendment Act, essentially arguing that this was an internal matter so similar to uh, the, the trip that was organized, um, it was essentially the promotion of a far right agenda uh, used in their argument um, uh, against the sort of collaborative 
uh, elements of surrounding Islamic terrorism. So essentially what I want to um, represent in this example is how far-right collaboration is occurring within the upper echelons of state diplomacy and not just at the grassroots activist level. So I want to end this uh, presentation by simply addressing, so why should we care? The first point is that India is the world's largest democracy of 1.4 billion people. And at the same time, it's an example of what happens when a successful far right party is in government. And indeed, it is an example of democratic backsliding when a far right government is elected to power. At the same time, this provides legitimacy to a country which is broadly considered to be an ally to the West. So it does pose some difficult questions to be had. The second point, and I think one that's perhaps more pertinent, is that the far right is becoming more globally connected, which has been evident by recent terrorist attacks. One only needs to look, for example, at the Christchurch attack last year and the subsequent copycat attacks that were inspired through online forums such as 4chan and 8chan. Indeed, the Indian far right is not immune to being part of this global network, and this is especially true online. Just as an example of this, we have seen the a number of 4chan users based in India who are sharing anti-Muslim conspiracy theories during the coronavirus using hashtags such as Corona Jihad which is a play on the term love jihad, which is when Muslim men supposedly seduce and convert a young Hindu woman to Islam. And so that same theme of um, Islamization is at play here with the Corona Jihad hashtag. And it's the coronavirus, as we have seen with all far right actors across the world, has become an opportunity to capitalize on existing anti-Muslim sentiment using conspiracy theories. What I've noticed in my research of late is how 4chan users in India are sharing these ideas with users around the world in order to advance a far-right narrative of Islamization. The risk here is the potential for escalation and perhaps even accelerationism, which should be of concern considering how online spaces have become hotbeds of radicalization. So thank you for your time. I think now we have them um, for, for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Evian. Um, I see that we have received uh, a number of interesting questions. Um, we'll uh, go through the list and see, um, do it in a democratic manner. Uh, so by the popular vote, we can start with a question from Jan. Um, Jan writes, uh, in October 2019, many uh, MEPs, uh, mainly Euro uh, members of the European Parliament, mainly Eurosceptics and Europhobes, visited Kashmir and then met Mobi. What were the main learnings of this meeting, and can we now talk of a far right international? Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is the very first time in which we saw the far right collaborating at such an international scale and it. Um, you know, not just between activists, but through elected representatives. Um, so this is quite telling the fact that, um, you know, we saw this being legitimized or perhaps far right agendas being legitimized through this meeting. Um, I remember shortly after the event took place, I mean, it was very controversial, but people essentially said, well, what, what's really the purpose? What will be the lasting outcome of this meeting? And uh, we didn't really see perhaps um, 
its effect within the European Parliament until the a few months later in which I've mentioned how these MEPs called for the bill to be withdrawn concerning India's uh, passage of the Citizenship Amendment Act. I mean, we'll still have to sort of wait to see um, a bit more in terms of how these collaborations are uh, are institutionalized. Um, I mean, Modi, of course, has has been re-elected, but we're starting to see now whether this the wave of far right populism can maintain its hold, and particularly after the coronavirus pandemic is is over, whether or not the actions taken by these far right populist leaders will still maintain their strong bases of support. Um, but I mean, thanks. That's a that's a very uh, great question. Thank you. Um, over to a uh, question, uh, anonymous question. Um, how is Modi's Hindu nationalism reflected in the country's foreign policy and uh, how has this evolved over time? Yeah, so I mean, the, the perhaps the most explicit example that I discussed was that involving Jammu and Kashmir, um, you know, which some could argue is perhaps more of a domestic policy, but also has foreign policy implications. Uh, we have for also seen the um, effect in terms of increased um, missiles testing along the Pakistani border. Um, and at one point, there was a, a very real fear shortly before the 2019 election, where there was the threat of an escalating uh, war between India and Pakistan. And many analysts attributed this to um, perhaps bolstering the popularity for Modi shortly before the 2019 election. It was essentially a tactic used uh, in order to demonstrate his authority as a, as a strong man in the region. Uh, but I'm not exactly an expert on the foreign policy of the administration, so I sort of have to apologize for that. But I can speak to perhaps how the Hindu nationalist agenda is being implemented through uh, specific foreign policy legislative agendas such as Jammu and Kashmir and then the threat of an escalating war between India and Pakistan shortly before the 2019 election. Okay, moving on, uh, there, another anonymous question. Um, this has probably been partly answered already, but do you know how far right movements uh, elsewhere, or far right movements or parties elsewhere in the world view uh, Hindu nationalism? Do they consider them as allies? Mm. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, it's interesting because on the one hand, we do see certain collaborations through the counter jihad movement, uh, as articulated through Tommy Robinson and then through certain um, perhaps intellectual individuals uh, like Daniel Freeberg. There are, for instance, um, uh, or one, one good example is, is uh, Greg Johnson, who is a white nationalist and who maintains a publishing house called Counter Currents. And he has a whole archive of Hindu nationalist writings. So there's perhaps some certain intellectual figures or metapolitical figures um, and then, like I mentioned, and also Alexander Dugan, who are very interested in, in Hindu nationalism. But on the one hand, it sort of brings to light um, how esoteric are these elements? I mean, I think if you were to ask the sort of common 4chan user what they think about Hindu nationalism or in India, they probably don't care or probably, um, you know, see it as an insignificant movement. So I think uh, there's certainly some mixed responses. There's certainly some fragmentation um, when it comes to how other far right movements view Hindu nationalism. That might be um, a perhaps Western centric way of understanding this. If we look, for instance, at um, Buddhist nationalist far right movements in Southeast Asia, so in, in Myanmar, for example, there is actually a lot of collaboration happening within Asia um, between Hindu nationalists and Buddhist nationalists, for example. And this is all united by a common anti-Muslim, anti-Islam sentiment. So thank you for that question. 
Yeah, we have another great question here, an uh, anonymous uh, question as well. Um, could you please say something about the opposition uh, against the Hindu nationalism, nationalism within India and itself uh, in terms of size and composition and strength and, and what role do the business community and the rest of civil society play here? Uh, do, uh, are the nationalists getting any domestic pushback? Hmm. Um, so certainly there is a sizable opposition to Hindu nationalism. So apart from the BJP, which is the ruling political party, there is also the Indian National Congress Party, which is a secular uh, center left political party, which for most of India's um, electoral history from 1947 has been the ruling party within India. So when the BJP won in 2014, this caused a, a major upset to the political balance. Um, you know, there, there is certainly a strong opposition to the BJP and we see this um, amongst academics, amongst journalists. The problem is that academics and journalists have been censored and have faced deadly consequences for voicing their opposition to the BJP, partly because the BJP and Modi and Hindu nationalism is so popular within India. Now, in terms of the business community, that's a very good um, point to bring up. And I would say that um, by and large, uh, you know, businesses do support uh, Hindu nationalism and Modi, particularly because Modi is well known for articulating this development myth. So again, this push towards creating India as this techno-economic powerhouse, which is a massive industry within a growing middle class within India. So there are, um, so in terms of Modi's relationship to the business community, it actually tends to be quite favorable. Um, indeed, you know, Modi has taken a somewhat protectionist stance um, through his quote to make an India initiative, um, which is about protecting Indian business interests. Um, but yeah, in terms, I think back to, to the sort of the domestic pushback, I mean, I would say that it's certainly there and um, the passage of the Citizenship Amendment Act sort of displayed the growing opposition, um, not just within India, but, you know, sort of international support against Modi. And when it comes to the um, international reputation of Modi, I think things are starting to change a little bit given the events that have happened in Jammu and Kashmir and the most recent riots that occurred this February. You know, there has been um, more outspoken um, journalists and media coverage of Modi and the Hindu nationalist agenda. So I do think that there is a growing international awareness of Hindu nationalism in India. Okay, we'll move on to a question from um, from Cam. Uh, there are some. Um, who would you recommend reading or paying attention to in order to get a better idea of what is happening with the far right outside of the West, besides yourself, of course. Uh. <laughs> um, hmm. You know, this is a very difficult question to answer because I don't actually know um, that, that, that many designated scholars. Um, I am part of this um, um, Center for Analysis of the Radical Right, which is an online network of scholars around the world who focus on the far right. And most of the scholars within the network do focus on, on Europe and North America, but there are a few besides me who work on, for instance, um, the far right in South Africa, in Latin America, in other parts of Asia that might be of interest. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's sort of a difficult question because there, there's, there aren't actually um, that many scholars who work on. I mean, the interesting thing is, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, is that there are scholars who, for instance, might work on issues that we term or label as ethnic cleansing or as right wing authoritarianism, but it may not necessarily be recognized as a sort of specifically far right framework. And I think, you know, that we have to come away from perhaps just focusing on um, regional understandings of certain phenomena and look towards um, comparing them in a universal framework of the far right. So that's what I'm trying to do in my research is I'm trying to push for 
uh, perhaps a, a more global understanding of the far right besides uh, it being confined as a sort of regional phenomenon through other names, that is. Yeah, there's a question from Ed. Um, fascinating seminar, Evian. Uh, to what extent does the global far right network, as you frame it, begin and end with Islamophobia? Most examples you give uh, of the nexus between Hindu nationalism and other right wing movements around the world seem to pivot around anti Muslim politics. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ed, and I'm so glad you could join. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, certainly Islamophobia becomes the um, sort of point of um, uniting together these various far right movements. But, you know, of course, we know that that, um, you know, far right movements can be quite fragmented and diverse. So the motivation could be you know, predominantly one of anti-Semitism or one based on racial supremacy. Um, I am part of uh, in my postdoc uh, as in this intersect or intersecting flows of Islamophobia research network. So we are um, a team of researchers looking at various flows of Islamophobia globally. Um, and that ranges from Asia to um, Europe to North America uh, to Latin America and so forth. And it's looking at how certain articulations of Islamophobia might be understood locally. So there might be certain contextual local narratives that inform people's understandings of anti-Muslim sentiment, but how this then gets coalesced within a global constellation of far-right movements. Um, I mean, I'm sort of convinced at this point that Islamophobia is sort of the one factor that unites together the, um, the far-right within, within India and, and other uh, Western far right movements. But of course, there are exceptions. If we look, for instance, at the far right in Japan, it's primarily based on an anti Korean minority activism, for example. Or if we were to look at the far right in Turkey under Erdogan, I mean, this is a pan Turkism movement, uh, which is which distinctly overlaps with um, certain aspects of Islamic authoritarianism. So um, you know, there's certainly a risk in attributing Islamophobia as sort of the one factor that unites together far right movements, but it certainly um, plays, I think, a role in at least creating or um, providing a basis for some of these transnational connections that we see taking place and particularly online. So thank you, Ed. See, moving on, um, there's an anonymous question. Could you please elaborate a bit more about the racist creed of the Hindu nationalistic movement? Yeah. Um, sorry, just a moment. So for Hindu nationalists, or at least for the founders and the development of Hindu nationalism as an ideology, um, as I mentioned, uh, religion was something that became secondary to race. So it's this notion that Hindus constitute um, part of a larger Aryan race. So there's this distinct Indo-European um, element of, of racial identity here, which is another aspect of Hindu nationalism that perhaps unites it with some of these more esoteric um, elements of the extreme right in the West. Um, and it's this notion essentially that uh, Hindus constitute, being a Hindu is, is a distinct race. And that is tied to a territorial claim, which is namely that of the Hindu Rastra or, or the Hindu state. Um, and race became quite a, a prominent framework for Hindu nationalism, really around the same time that Hindu nationalists started engaging with uh, their counterparts in Nazi Germany and were sort of inspired by the racial superiority of the Nazi regime um, as sort of uh, as a model um, towards implementing sort of racial um, categories in, in, in sort of a militant totalitarian fashion. Um, but yeah, uh, that's that's a, that's a great question. And I think, you know, it's something that we need to sort of acknowledge because of the fact that, you know, Hindu nationalism is 
is usually misunderstood as a form of religious extremism, but it's very important to recognize the sort of blood and soil determinants within Hindu nationalist ideology. Great. Um, well, we're soon running out of time, but we, I guess we can have a few more questions. Um, how are neighboring and other states reacting to Modi's anti-Muslim moves? Is there any significant pushback uh, besides the obvious candidate of Pakistan? Are, are other countries uh, uh, pushing back against the, the policies? Um, so certainly Pakistan, as I sort of mentioned, um, and this escalating tension between the two countries. Um, China, interestingly, has sort of responded to 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 Hindu nationalism, but um, and and you know, interestingly, you know, there's because these are seen as the two perhaps competing uh, global superpowers. I mean, there's there's a lot of a geopolitical in um, uh, 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 landscapes that are that are playing a significant role here, but um, um, you know something that um, I've seen circulating with these um, uh, coronavirus conspiracy theories within India is is um, you know also this sinophobic or anti-China uh, conspiracy theories that are circulating as well. Um, now that's not unique to the Indian far right or to the to the far right in general. We see a lot of anti Chinese conspiracy theories circulating online at the moment, but um, it was something that I wasn't necessarily expecting when it came to looking at some of these Indian far right actors on online. Um, but I mean, that's just a very specific example, but uh, I would say that, yes, there's certainly some um, pushback from China in this regards, but um, I'm not exactly an expert on this area, so I, I apologize um, uh, for my ignorance otherwise. But uh, yeah, Pakistan and China certainly um, have pushed back against Hindu nationalism. OK, we'll have time for one last question. This is um, a question from my newbie colleague, uh, Tamta. Uh, thank you for a very comprehensive presentation, Evian. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on how the mainstream, uh, mainstream of the far right happened. As you said, uh, until 2014, Hindu nationalism remained on the fringes. So it would be interesting to know what factors you would see as having contribu contributed to mainstreaming and, and normalization of the far right, uh, ultimately resulting in Modi's election. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tamta, for, for listening in. I'm so glad you could join. Um, I mean, this is such a complex and such a large question, but I'll try to narrow it down to a few points. Um, the first, I think, significant aspect was that in 1991, India opened up its economy to neoliberalization. And the governing Indian National Congress Party, which is um, seen as or has a reputation for being anti business or anti-capitalist um, sort of fell out of favor amongst public opinion. So in the 1990s, the BJP seized upon the opportunity to present itself as the pro-market, pro-business political party. And uh, part of this is attributed to the fact that the BJP has always appealed to a sort of middle class elitist demographic. Um, so certainly the BJP sees an opportunity to sort of present itself to the public as a, a pro-business political party. Uh, and that sort of led to the mainstreaming of its far-right agendas uh, because it provided a sort of um, normalization effect uh, through through using uh, business and, and uh, economic development to, to promote its uh, far-right agenda. Um, and then also in the 1990s, we saw um, a sort of a shift in popular culture. So um, access to, um, to television and to media became much more um, um, democratized. So, you know, there was there was more increased access to, to media technologies. And um, in the 1990s, you know, there was, for instance, television serials around um, Hindu nationalism that um, became quite popular for, for, for people to watch. So um, I would say that neoliberalization as well as increasing access to media channels in the 1990s really helped the BJP to 
uh, spread and, and disseminate its, its propaganda um, to a much wider public audience. But again, it wasn't really until 2014, as I mentioned, through a figure like Modi, who didn't campaign on a Hindu nationalist extreme platform, but campaigned as a very populist, uh, charismatic individual. So um, in many ways, Modi represents the new face of Hindu nationalism. And certainly we can see this with other far right movements around the world is these populist charismatic figures for these movements. Okay, unfortunately, thank you very much, uh, Evian. Um, unfortunately, we've uh, we've run out of run out of time. Uh, we uh, would like to, on behalf of both Nupi and the consortium, I'd like to thank you, Evian, for uh, for uh, your presentation. I also like to thank the audience for uh, brilliant questions. Uh, sorry, we couldn't go through all of them. Um, um, I also like to thank the the communications department and the IT department here at Nupi for for their uh, help in in in, in organizing. Um, thank you for watching, and uh, we hope to see you again at uh, future seminars.